everyone. My name is Sarah Walker and I am the Education Coordinator at MAR and producer of our free webinar series. Our webinar today is Home Inspections, Prepare Your Clients and Mitigate Stress. The webinar will cover essential aspects of a home inspection and provide risk management strategies for agents during the inspection. You will learn how to prepare expectations of a home buyer and mitigate the emotional stress brought on by the home inspection. The webinar will be recorded and archived on marealtor.com after the live version. If you have any questions throughout the session, please type them in the bottom of the chat box on your screen and we will hold a Q&A afterward. Our presenter today is Matt Smith. Matt is the Director of Business Development for Warren Home Inspections. He has been in the inspection industry since 2011 and worked with both, both Warren Home Inspections and Texinspec, a firm in Dallas, Texas. Warren Home Inspections has been in business in Massachusetts since 1985 and provides home inspection and environmental testing services to home buyers across the state. Now over to Matt. All right, thank you, Sarah. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so today we're gonna talk about uh, uh, some things that you need, you can understand about home inspections and how to avoid some aggravations. So risk management, and uh, client preparation techniques, as well as kind of a, a brief overview of home inspections and what is covered in a home inspection, what you might wanna prepare your clients with. Some of you guys might know what's covered in a home inspection already, but even just a, like a little refresher course to uh, help pass that information on to your buyers certainly doesn't hurt. So what we're here to do today is to make sure that uh, your clients are prepared enough. And sometimes, you know, depending on if you guys are working with a home inspector that maybe your clients picked, they said they knew somebody, you've never worked with them. Sometimes you, if you don't have any relationship with that home inspector, you might end up making this face as you're waiting for the home inspection report to be delivered. So we're here today to make sure that that doesn't happen. So I'm gonna cover some key points over the 45 minutes that I have with you guys. I'll just give you a, a heads up. I'm gonna cover kind of a brief overview of components of the home inspection. I'm not gonna be able to go into, in 45 minutes, every single aspect of every single component of the home inspection. We're not gonna be able to discuss you know, every single component of flashing or uh, drainage systems or things like that. I'm gonna give you a brief overview of what, what a home inspection looks like, as well as I'm gonna talk briefly about the history of the home inspection industry, what a home inspection is, what a home inspection is not, a couple of pointers about how to advise your clients when to order a home inspection and how to set some expectations for them as well. So I'm going to start with the home inspection industry. We are licensed and we are regulated by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Uh, we have a set of standards, professional standards, that we have to adhere to legally called CMR 266. Uh, I'll be referring to that uh, throughout this presentation, but that is basically the set of minimum standards that the home inspector the home inspector has to subscribe to. And uh, one of the big things is that when we're going through the home, our performance standard as dictated by the CMR 266, it does leave some broad interpretations to the inspector, but one thing it does say is that we're there to find items, quote, in need of repair. And then of course the question becomes, well, what does that mean? What are items in need of repair? And to define that further, those are items that are either not functioning as intended. So for example, if a roof is leaking, that roof is not functioning as it's supposed to intend. It's basically not providing that cover at that point. It's leaking, it's allowing leaks in, or it's not functioning adequately. Um, I'll give you a couple of examples that we're going along, as we're going along, I'll provide a picture. But one example of that might be um, some a gas system with a flame that has an orange flame instead of a blue flame. That might be an instance where there's uh, something to be concerned about because sometimes that can lead to uh, combustion issues. And then also safety issues. So another example that I like to use is um, that, that kind of illustrates my point is an open-ended handrail on a set of stairs that have three risers or more. Um, 
those handrails might have these points that stick out, they don't return to the wall, that becomes a snagging hazard at that point. So that can, can become a tripping hazard too, because that can those points can stick and grab purses, they can grab belt loops, they can grab sweaters and things like that. So that is just an, one example of what might be defined as a safety hazard. Now, like I said, there is a lot of interpretation by our standards that is left open to the home inspectors as to determine what is performing adequately versus what is not. But those are the three components that there were there to find. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about what a home inspection is not as well in some things that we are either not supposed to do or really it's not our business to do as we're going along as well. So we are licensed and regulated by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Inspector licensing was issued in the year 2000. That's when we actually started being licensed. So sometimes people think that the license number sometimes can indicate the age of how long the inspector has been in business. And that's not always the case. Uh, the first initial group of home inspectors, I mean, there's some home inspectors that have been around uh, even since around 1985. And for those, they were kind of just batch grouped together. Uh, there was no, this person has been in business this longer than this person, so they got a they got a lower night license number. So there is some aspect that you might be able to determine how long somebody's been in business, but there are some batch numberings going on as well. So it's not a perfect exact science. One more thing that I do want to make mention of on licensing is how many licensed home inspectors are in the state of Massachusetts. Now, the last time I looked, there was 535 licensed inspectors in the entire state of Massachusetts. Um, usually around licensing time, when, when the licensing comes up, you know, you usually see about every year, 100 home inspectors or so drop off experientially um, from, they just let their licenses lapse. So there's probably about 435 practicing active licensed home inspectors in the state of Massachusetts, just to give you an idea of how many of us there are out there. Um, just for comparison's sake, uh, I was working in a home inspection firm in Dallas before I moved up here to Massachusetts, uh, Dallas, Texas, and there was 1,000 inspectors just in the city of Dallas alone. So there are some differentiation things that go on in the, in the, in the nation. So here's a couple of things that a home inspection is. Uh, it is a inspection for visual, uh, it's a visual inspection. There might be some tools that other home inspectors use. Um, I've seen home inspectors bring in some, like for example, some top of the line thermal cameras that sometimes can look and show whether or not there's missing insulation in a wall or things like that. But for the most part, and identified in the CMR 266 standards, um, we it is at least a visual inspection. Uh, so we are vis inspecting anything that we are able to see. So we're, we're inspecting visually. Uh, it's, we're inspecting for functionality and safety like I outlined prior. I will mention it is a snap in time. So there may become issues where a home inspection report dictates that the washing machine or the washing machine, the dishwasher um, was working at the time of the inspection, but even as close as three weeks later, it may leak. Uh, that doesn't always happen. That does may sometimes happen. Um, one, time, one thing that we try to communicate to home buyers is that we are just looking at what is going on at the home at the time of the inspection. Uh, we can't really predict the future. We can't predict when something might happen. And I, I'm gonna use the roof as an example here in a few minutes, but sometimes if you try to get the inspector to give a estimation on lifespan of a component, you know, you can get into a, a kind of a hairy situation as well. Um, and what I would say to you at that point is if you want your home inspector to make, I guess, estimations on whether or not something is nearing the end of its useful life, then, I mean, work with a home inspector that does that. But if you don't want that, then, you know, that most home inspectors or some home inspectors, some do make those estimations. Some don't really want to get in the habit of going, oh, that's a 20 year roof, therefore it's going to leak tomorrow. That's a 30 year roof, therefore um, some believe that there's no fast, hard rule on age versus function. So we're really just inspecting what's going on at that home at that time. On average, it takes about two and a half to three hours. I know that there's some home inspectors out there who take shorter than that and some home inspectors that take 
longer than that. I say the rule of thumb is to say about an hour per thousand square feet. Um, if the home inspector is whipping through the home in two and a half hours in a 6,000 square foot home and he's by himself, he might not have seen everything. Um, but if he's at a town home that's like 600 square feet and he's there for five hours, um, you know, what's going on with that town home? And that actually causes buyers sometimes unduly to, to start to worry because, well, why is he taking so long? So I say the average is on, on average about for a 2,500 square foot home is the kind of line of demarcation for me. It's on average about two and a half to three hours, and that's including if the inspector is going to go over his findings on site with the with you and the home buyer, or at least the home buyer. Um, it's an informational only inspection, so we're there to find out the defects going on in the home. We're there to find out what items are functioning as intended, functioning adequately, or are safety issues. Um, I know that some people may consider using the home inspection report for negotiation purposes. The home inspector, in my personal opinion, I'm gonna kind of keep as much of the soapboxing to a minimum. <laughs> and I'm certainly not gonna use this as a sales pitch for Warren Home Inspections either. Is, I mean, I'm here to give good information, you guys. Uh, but in my opinion, the home inspection should not be turning to the buyers and going, oh, if you put this in the, uh, you know, with this in the report, you might be able to negotiate X amount of dollars off of the listing price at that point. You know, now we're just tap dancing all over your feet. And I think that's that's not our place to do that. We're just there to provide the information off of what we see as far as defects go. Um, not necessarily telling anybody, here's what you're gonna do with your report. You know, we're there to provide the information. And then at that point, you know, it's up to you guys, your buyers and you guys to decide what you wanna do with the report at that point. I liken us to a general practitioner in, as far as the medical field. So we are probably going to refer a specialist or few if there is a component that is out of our scope of knowledge or there's an issue where we see something happening that we know is a defect in the home but we don't know exactly what's causing it there might come a time where we go you know you might want to have an electrician come and take a look at this further to be able to tell you what's going on with this issue further. Or you might want to be able to have a roofer come out here and take a look as to what's causing the leak or the extent of the leaking in this home. We're just noting leaking. Uh, it becomes a fine dance. Uh, some real estate agents have told me, because I've, I've talked to a lot of real estate agents in my line of work, some real estate agents have told me that they would prefer the inspectors just to write the defects and refer a specialist out to everything. And then I've had buyers call me in the past and you know had buyers call you know some of my friends in the inspection industry in the past as well usually when when people are first starting out in the inspection industry they start referring multiple contractors and then they go well you hire you suggested that i call a foundation expert you suggested i call an electrician you suggested i call a roofer you say so what did i pay you your fee for and so it becomes a fine dance for us to make sure that the buyer doesn't feel like they didn't get their money's worth by coming to us and having them walk through the home, but as well as not trying to speak out of turn about what we know and what we don't. And if you have specific issues that you might see in the home coming through, there might be a good idea to advise your buyer to ask the home inspector as they're interviewing us, because I know usually there's multiple inspectors getting the call. It might be a good idea to advise the buyers to ask the inspector if they have specific issue about the plumbing. So what's your background in relation to your experience with plumbing? What's your background in experience in relation to experience with electric, um, electricity or electro, electrical work? So it might be good ideas to advise them onto that, but usually what's gonna happen with a home inspection report is they're gonna be referring at least a couple of specialists out. Just like if you go to a general practitioner as far as a doctor, they might say, you know, I see something going on up here in your nasal passages, or you might, you know, down here in your throat, maybe down to the chest, you might wanna go see this ear, nose, and throat doctor that I know, and they'll be able to tell you a little bit more about what's going on at that point. Now, that's kind of the way I see our home inspection industry. We're kind of like a general practitioner. We'll be able to tell you what's going on with the general health of the home, but for specific health issues and relating to the home that might be, on, might be beyond our scope or might need further examination by somebody more focused down in those issues, at that point, we will uh, will recommend a specialist in those those fields. So, a couple of things a home inspection is not: it's not invasive or exhaustive. So, just like 
I'm not going to be able to go over every component of the home inspection over the 40 of the now the 30 minutes that we have together. I am timing myself. So I promise you guys, I will finish on time. Uh, just like I can't go over every component of the home in just a half hour we have together, uh, you know, for us to go over every little aspect of the home, we would be there for six, eight hours. You know, we might be there a whole day if it was going to be an invasive or exhaustive procedure. And uh, at that point, you know, that then that becomes a, uh, a whole different can of worms. That's why we have our CMR 266 standards to adhere to. And that's kind of our performance standard at that point as to what we're going to be looking for when we're going through the house. So uh, every home inspector is required to follow those standards at the bare minimum. Now, some might exceed those standards. Um, and if you want a more invasive home inspection that lasts six hours, eight hours, something like that, there might be a home inspector out there that does that. Um, but there's you know, a lot of home inspectors, they use that hour per thousand square foot uh, rule of thumb as well. So it's just dependent on what you or your buyer might want or might advise you might advise your buyer to look for when they're doing a home inspection but it's it's generally not an exhaustive or an invasive procedure it is not an appraisal in fact per our cmr 266 standards we are outlawed we are forbidden from giving any kind of financial valuation of the home that is somebody else's job it is not an appraisal the home inspector should not be giving any kind of appraisal even if they might be you know, have a past life as an appraiser or something like that. Uh, they, you know, they're not allowed while they're wearing their home inspector hat to start appraising the home. So it is not an appraisal. And while we're talking about financial numbers, home inspectors cannot put in writing any kind of financial numbers as far as repair estimates of the home either per our CMR 266 standards. Um, so if you, that's actually illegal per our procedures. I have seen some home inspectors in the industry who have thought that they feel that a verbal ballpark, a verbal, a verbal financial ballpark about what it might cost to replace something is in the interest of their clients. I was actually at a couple of classes where this came up. Uh, and I know that once again, I, you know, that's, that's kind of, fumbling around in the dark, in my opinion. I'm like, I'm in a soapbox as much as, much as, as least as I can. But I, you know, I, I feel that throwing any kind of a financial numbers out about any kind of price estimates or things like that, it's just not, we're not there. That's not our place to do that. Um, but that's just my opinion. And now there, you know, I, as we go along, feel free to ask any questions. I'll answer them at the end. Um, and I'm, like I said, gonna try and keep my opinion out of it to a minimal amount. It's not a cosmetic inspection, so you're not going to see the inspector going through writing up chipping tiles, peeling wallpaper, things that really will not, I would not consider, or our standards would not consider defects. You know, cheap chipping tiles, peeling wallpaper, that's not set, that's not safety, that's not performance at that point. That's a cosmetic issue, and that, that really doesn't go into a home inspection. It is not a code inspection. And I will tell you that a lot of building codes are thrown around when inspectors are getting their licenses as kind of a baseline standard of here's why these things are in our CMR 266 standards. But code is such a hairy issue and it's not put in our performance standards to tell anybody that this is not up to code, that it's not up to code, this needs to be brought up to code, that needs to be brought up to code. Um, it's just a very, a uh, hairy issue to even do. And, um, you know, but it's not per CMR 266. I will tell you, there is nothing that says in our CMR 266 standards, we need to do a, a code inspection. We need to be talking about code at all in our performance standard. It's not a warranty and it's not a guarantee. So if there is a, an issue with the home after the inspection is done, there is nothing on paper or there is no guarantee that uh, those there, there, that anything will be covered if something breaks down after the home inspection. Um, you know, there, there are inspectors out there, I believe, that have, there, there are services out there where warranties are offered. Um, but, you know, it, once again, that's a per home inspector issue. Um, I would say, you know, just keeping general rule of thumb, there's no warranty or a guarantee that if something's working at the time of the inspection that it will work later on 
and they're not required, so you just wanna make sure you protect yourself. Uh, so with that kind of being taken care of, I'm gonna go quickly through some of the aspects of the home inspection and uh, briefly give you an overview. Like I said, we're gonna tackle the big items. I'm, I'm just gonna cover a couple of the big items. So uh, structural, electrical, heating, air conditioning, ventilation, plumbing, appliances, and there are some other inspections that uh, our other services inspectors do offer that I'll, I'll touch on briefly but they're not covered in our CMR 266 standards. It doesn't say that we can't do them. It just says per a home inspection, what fee, what you're offering for your fee, you, these are not covered under that home inspection. You could provide an additional inspection for additional fee. So when we're talking about the basements, if your home looks like this, uh, if your basement looks like this, uh, we got a problem first of all. <laughs> um, but there's two kinds commonly of homes and really there's one kind most common of uh, foundations in homes around Massachusetts. You'll see some slab homes in certain pockets of certain neighborhoods around Massachusetts, um, but the majority of homes that you're gonna find here in Massachusetts are basement homes. We are required to render an opinion on the function, the functionality of the foundation that we are inspecting. Uh, one big thing to keep in mind of when you're looking at home, when you're looking at foundations with, um, with your inspector is, you know, one, one thing that an inspector is looking for, one of the big things is any indications of movement. Uh, so the cracks, that's, there's some cracks that are causes for concern and there's some are not, and there's not an exact science on the cracks. Now I'll give you a quick overview about the different kinds of cracks. There's really three to keep in mind. You got the little small vertical hairline cracks that you might see in a foundation. That's just, you know, usually the, um, result of you know the soil outside pushing up against the uh the foundation and so those are really just kind of cracks from that nothing to be concerned about um you know those are usually the least concerning cracks you might have a differential crack which is kind of usually a diagonal crack where you see a smaller crack at the bottom and a bigger crack up at the top or a bigger crack down at the bottom than the top. And that might be something to be a little bit more concerned about. And then the one that most people are concerned about is the horizontal cracks. And there's some horizontal cracks that don't need to be, that, you know, there's no cause for concern. And there are some horizontal cracks that are cause for concern about the functionality of what's going on with that um, foundation. And uh, that's what we would call an iceberg problem. And I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later, what I mean by iceberg problem. When we're suggesting further evaluation, um, usually the two kind of professionals or specialists that get called in or structural engineer or foundation company. The difference is structural engineer will collect a fee, come out, tell you the functionality of the foundation and say, all right, that's my opinion, bye. A foundation company sometimes gives a free estimate, but they come out and they might say, oh, it looks like you might need to, and I'm gonna put a little caveat in front of this and say, by no means am I suggesting that every foundation out company out there is only in the interest of doing this in order to sell home uh, a foundation company and then therefore are don't trust a foundation company. I'm not saying that, but some foundation companies might use that free estimate as a loss leader to get in and go, oh, look at that. I think you need a $20,000 foundation and a foundation that's perfectly fine. Uh, so you can get either or a structural engineer or a foundation company. Just keep in mind kind of what might be going on with that situation. With the roof, uh, I this is the only time I've ever seen this. We are required to render an opinion on the materials of roof, um, bathroom tiles, <laughs> kitchen tiles. I, I don't really see that a lot. In fact, 99% of the time, you're gonna see composition shingles. That's good. You're gonna see about 99% of the time around here. Wood, clay, you don't see a lot of rubber, flat, you know, sometimes there are flat roofs. Uh, sometimes rubber roofs are used for like commercial flat buildings, uh, flat roof buildings. Uh, you might see some slate roofs. Um, Coming from the uh, coming from the Southwest in Texas, I slate. I had never seen slate until I came up here, and that was kind of cool. Uh, so you do see some slate roofs around here as well. Now it comes down to if you see a if you ask a home inspector, "Hey, Mr. Home Inspector, how old do you think the roof is?" Uh, you know that is. A key, that can be a hairy situation, uh, and that really depends on how you want your performance standard as a home inspector to be administered. Like I said, there are some home inspectors that believe that it is in their best interest to put in their reports uh, 
that the roof is 22 years old, thus nearing the end of its useful life. There are inspectors out there that do not believe there's any hard, fast rule of age versus function that a 40-year water heater might work just as well as the day it was installed and it was working fine at the time of the home inspection. Therefore, there's nothing to worry about. So every component of the home uh, if you know, it just depends on what performance standard you might like, and that might be a question to ask your home inspectors that you are uh, as you're building your vendor list uh, of inspectors that you might refer. Is uh, what's your performance standard, and what's your opinion, Mr. Home Inspector, Miss Home Inspector, on the functionality and age versus function of components in the home? Because uh, it's not required in our CMR 266 standards to make year predictions or uh, the functionality predictions dependent on age in our reports, but there are some inspectors that do write in their reports, component is nearing the end of its useful life, Re recommend this be repaired, replaced. And since we're talking about repair versus replacement, um, you know, some that's language that every home inspector might have different opinions on. Recommend this be repaired, recommend this be replaced. Some inspectors, and I'm not going to sense use a lot of uh, examples from the firm that I work with, but our, we say recommend these be corrected um, simply because, you know, repair, replace, you know, it's leading them in a certain direction. You know, I don't know if that's really our position to do, is to tell them what they need to repair, what they need to replace, where they're to identify defects. Um, so that's just opinion that you might want to look and ask as you're interviewing your home inspectors as to who's going to be part of your list. You know, what are your opinions on repair, replace? What what language do you use, you use in your report? And kind of how do you communicate that language as well to the buyers? Because sometimes what the home inspector says verbally is perfectly fine. And then they get that report and because it's in the written word and there's certain legal requirements that we need to put in our report, it becomes a little bit of a more daunting report to the home buyer. So that might be a question to ask your home inspectors is, what are your feelings on that? Structural, the uh, we're required to render an opinion on the materials used on the walls as well. Uh, so the siding, so you know, there's various kinds of siding brick, stucco, wood, cementitious, or fiber cement. Also, more com you know, it's most commonly known by its brand sometimes, which is hardy board. Uh, everybody's a pretty big fan of hardy board. I, I am one of those people. I do like hardy board. There's a couple of sidings that I, I really like. Of course, we leave our personal estimations out of that. Um, but, you know, siding, you know, wood cementitious siding is a pretty nice siding. Uh, we might be looking for wood rot. And if there's wood rot, you know, once again, repair, replace, you know, that's that's dependent on, you know, your opinions or your your interviews with those home inspectors. One thing I will let you know is we're going to use wood rot as a iceberg problem. So it doesn't necessarily mean when you find wood rot in a home that it's time to go, oh, my goodness, there's termites here. Everybody panic. And you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that. What I mean by iceberg problem is, is you see something, but there might be something below, bobbing below the surface of that water level, I guess, to use the metaphor, that might be a bigger problem. So if you see wood rot, a good inspector will go, oh, they're not going to vocalize it, because in my opinion, an inspector should not shoot their mouth off until they know what the problem is. But an inspector internally, mentally will take note and go, okay, this might mean termites. I just got to keep an eye out for that. So that's that's what an iceberg problem is. So a structural attic, uh, regarding the insulation, we are not required to make any um, an opinion on how well the insulation performs. We're not required to make an opinion per our standards on how much uh, insulation should be at home. We're just required to note the type of insulation used and how and if it's there. Um, with one a couple of things that we'll be looking for is water penetration in a home. Uh, as well as make or in an attic, as well as making sure it's properly ventilated, because the, you might find discoloration in an attic, and if it's not properly ventilated, it could lead to everybody's favorite four-letter word mold. However, just like with termites, an inspector should not immediately see any discoloration in a home and go, "Oh my God, it's mold," and freak everybody out. You don't really know if it's mold or not till you have it tested. Um, but ventilation could lead to, you know, improperly ventilated areas 
could lead to mold or a mold like you know you can use any term you want i've heard people say what they feel that the term should be used uh mold like substance unidentified microbial growth um but either way it can lead to some of those microbial issues that can cause concern amongst buyers electrical uh if you got this problem you know that's going <laughs> that's going in a report uh, but you know we're going to look at electro we're going to look at the electrical panel now i usually get this question a lot uh, when i teach classes about this kind of stuff where people ask me well i have an electrician friend and they hate it when you guys as the home inspectors pull panels and i can understand that they might hate it uh, but then sometimes people say well i've heard it's illegal and it's actually per our cmr 266 standards uh, which is you know what we legally have to operate under we are told that we need to if it's accessible and we can open it open the panel and take a look at what's going on inside we we have to do it it's legally our requirement currently under our cmr 266 standards and just to be you know just to be sure because the, the standards do change in the uh, uh from time to time from our licensing board um they don't sometimes notify us so you know we just kind of have to open up our standards and, and check it like a mantra <laughs> regularly to make sure that nothing's changed. Uh, the, as the last, the last uh, edits I saw of the standards, this was still in there that we have to open up the panels. Uh, we'll check lights, we'll check outlets, we'll check Z GFCIs. GFCIs, not from a code aspect, uh, but rather, you know, some home inspectors may feel that GFCIs could be a safety hazard or could lack of GF, GFCIs could be a safety hazard. So at that point, you know, they might consider that as part of their performance standard as far as this should be corrected or this should be, you know, considered. Uh, so that's, you know, GFCIs is, is from a safety standpoint, not necessarily from a code standpoint. And like I said, if any inspector says, you oh, that should be, that's well, per code, they should be GFCIs in here. Uh, they, they might be missing the forest for the trees, in my opinion. Uh, so heating, ventilation, AC. I did say I would like give you a picture, uh, picture evidence of what that flame might look like. So that might be something that we're, you know, should have a little investigation added into it because you know that's a pretty orange flame. You want a blue flame. Um, so we're going to check the heating units uh, as per our standards in any habitable home of the or any habitable room of the home, including the kitchen. There needs to be a heating source. Um, if there are air conditioning units, uh, we will test those for functionality, make sure they're functioning uh, adequately, make sure that they are functioning as intended. Ducts, um, you know, to see inside ducts, that's not necessarily a readily visible uh, issue. Uh, so that usually does not get covered. Now with plumbing. Fixtures, sinks, commodes, tubs, showers, uh, spigots. If there is, if any fixture is accessible per our standards, we are required to operate that and make sure that it's working. We'll test. We'll look at the supply and drain lines of all fixtures as well, uh, if they're accessible and vi visibly accessible. So, you know, supply and drain lines, making sure that you know water's being, you know, uh, supplied to the commode, to the sink, to the faucet, whatever it might be, and drain, make sure that it's draining properly. We will check those lines. Um, if we can see, we'll check for leaks as well. Uh, gas systems will test the water heater. Uh, we have to take a look at, make sure that it is working, uh, make sure that there's nothing on uh, the water heater that might be a safety hazard, like an improperly, um, improperly installed TPR valve, temperature pressure relief valve, which sometimes can, if it's installed improperly, or even in, in cases where the um, line where it dissipates or it kind of disperses, um, if that line is used with the improper material or um, they, it's installed too high, that can be a scalding hazard as well. Um, so the water heater will check for things like that. Kitchen appliances. Um, we will check all, and this is now part of our standards that it had, hasn't been previous iterations. We are required to take a look at any installed appliances, dishwashers, ovens, the cooktop. Um, you know, it's not might not necessarily be installed, but I know standard of care. Most home inspectors will test the microwave, um, food waste disposer, etc. You know, anything that's an installed appliance, we are required to test now for our standards. Um, Sometimes microwaves might be tested, even if it's not installed and it's planning to stay, you know. Um, garage door opener, 
We are required to test a garage door opener if we can, if it has a machine. We have to, per our standards, make sure that it responds to an automatic reverse stop. In other words, if it, if it encounters any kind of resistance, will it stop and back up? Uh, that is, uh, per our standards, uh, some home inspectors, you know, it's left open to how to test that standard. Uh, it can be anything from using certain objects and putting them on the floor to seeing that if it hits the thing and goes back up, uh, or it could be the home inspector simply stands by the garage door and then waits for it to, uh, with his back to it, waits for it to reach his or her fingers, give it a little nudge, nothing that we're, we're gonna break anything because we're not there to break anything, but give it a little nudge and see if it responds to that and reverses. So some other inspections to keep in mind that home inspectors might perform as well are a uh, functionality test for sprinkler systems or lawn irrigation systems. Uh, make sure that, you know, if there's a sprinkler system or a lawn irrigation system in the home, that there's no busted, uh, you know, nozzle heads or anything like that, that all the zones respond to controls. In other words, if you turn it on, will it turn on? Things like that. Uh, they might check a swimming pool. Um, to make sure that there's nothing going on like here <laughs> or there's any rips or tears or anything like that. Outbuildings, if you have like a guest home or a mother-in-law suite or um, things like that, and there's uh, living quarters and things like that, most, most buyers want that to be tested. So most home inspectors will go and they'll test that. It's not required per our standards, but most home inspectors will go out and they'll test the plumbing and the electricity and basically do uh, another home inspection on that guest home um, but most charge an additional fee for that well inspections home inspectors can test for quality and quantity on the wells one piece of advice i would give on this and you know the this is one moment where I will soapbox, is that if you have a home inspector that's doing a well quantity test and he's charging your buyer, um, make sure that it's not just sticking a garden hose in there and saying, oh, it fills up this much because it's a pretty inaccurate test. And we don't do that at, my, at the firm I work with because I feel like we'd be taking people's money at that point. Uh, but there are companies out there that do have well quantity testing equipment. They're well companies and things like that. Some home inspectors bring those third parties there and that's more of an accurate way to test or you know, get a well company to go out there. But if just a garden hose, I, I feel that's an inaccurate test and it's not really fair to charge a buyer money to do that. So uh, some final other inspections that other inspectors perform, uh, rate pest tests, uh, pest inspections. Um, so they just go through, make sure that uh, there is no um, sign of any wood destroying organisms when I say pests. So that means termites, that means carpenter ants, that means even, you know, other issues, powder post beetles, bees, things like that. Uh, just make sure that there's no problems with wood destroying organisms in the home. Um, and uh, also, they'll usually that accompanies, if it needs be, a, a form that says, hey, we went through, there were no active signs of any wood destroying insects. Uh, also, there were no signs of, there, was, there were no signs of any past damage, or if there was any past damage in the home, uh, documentation was provided that it had already been treated. So that's usually what happens with pest inspections. Radon inspections, um, usually those radon inspections are conducted two ways, either what's called a passive test or an active test. Passive tests are like charcoal canisters or liquid vials. Active tests are electronic monitors. Just, you know, and, and if you have any questions about that, I'll leave them at the end if you have any questions about passive versus active. Uh, but, uh, you know, just know kind of what a home inspector might be using for their testing. Mold, some home inspectors carry mold testing equipment with them. And then at that point, if there is any issues that the home owner or the home buyer rather might have about mold, the inspector can conduct a mold test at that point. And then if there's lead-based paint or lead-based paint issues, sometimes a home inspector can refer that out to somebody with what's called an XRF machine, which can scan the home for any signs of uh, lead-based paint if it's been painted over or anything like that. Or maybe they might have the machine themselves. That's the most accurate way to test for paint for lead-based paint um, if it's an issue. So when to, leave, when to order the inspection, you wanna make sure you leave yourself plenty of time, especially in summer, which we're knocking on the door. Uh, if the market, the summer market hasn't hit, it's, uh, it's right there. Um, in summer, a lot of home inspectors start getting booked up and they start getting booked up early. And uh, if you have a home inspector that you know, you like, you trust, you love, uh, you want, and it might, he might have a certain limited amount of availability, you wanna make sure that your buyers are calling them on the front end as opposed to the tail end to make sure that they get an appointment. 
Uh, if you want a weekend, I can say from experience, these book up the fastest because nobody wants to take time off work. So if you know that you're getting a home inspection, it might be a good idea to call in Monday to book for a Saturday, or if that home inspector does Sunday, Sunday. Um, if you, there's any utilities issues, I would advise trying to get those utilities on before the inspector gets there. Then they can get the complete inspection done and there's no waiting period of time for the utilities to be turned on the inspector to come back out. And sometimes weather just happens, snow on the roof, things are invisible uh, for the inspector. The things are not visible for the inspector to take a look at. Um, they might say, all right, well, I'll come back when the snow clears and then we'll look at that. So weather might be something like that as well. And sometimes that's completely unavoidable. So last five minutes I'm going to spend here are some risk management tactics and risk management strategies you might want to know um, for both for you guys and for us. So the big thing that I always make sure to mention is that when it comes to homeowners belongings, I would advise if you're the listing agent, and I'm sure you guys do this, but just the, even the day before the inspection might be a good idea to advise the sellers to try to make sure that the area is as clear for the home inspector as is possible. Because you don't want to take responsibility for homeowners' belongings, and we don't want to take uh, responsibility for homeowners' belongings. We don't want to be touching anything. And I know you guys don't want to either, so that's usually why you advise them. It might just be a good time right before the inspection just to advise them again, hey, guys, make sure that everything's clear for the home inspector. Some home inspection companies, and this is something we do if we can get the sellers, uh, the listing agents contact information, we'll even forward a video or a, a message to send forward to the seller to say, hey, Mr. or Mrs. Seller, or Mr. and Mrs. Seller in some cases, this is the, some of the things you wanna make sure you do prior to the home inspection. So if you have a home inspector that works with that, or you know that home inspector does that, you know, and you're the buyer's agent and you want the listing agent to know that information, that might be a really good idea to just say, hey, here's the listing agent's information. Just let them know that, you know, you're passing this information along to them to pass on to their sellers. Uh, so when at the garage, if there's an attic access in a garage and there's cars, it would be a really good idea to park the cars outside of the garage. Um, if there's a brand new BMW, we certainly don't want to open that attic access and watch things just fall straight out of the car and dent that thing up. You know, that tends to have uh, angry sellers giving us a call. So I advise them to park outside of the garage. And that same token, uh, there's a friend of mine who in the inspection industry who works out of Asheville, North Carolina. And he said he had a home where there was a workbench, like a tool bench on the side of the garage. And it was bolted to the wall, so they couldn't get it moved, uh, even just an inch to see what was going beyond that tool bench. And there was water penetration damage on the end of, the end of that wall when the buyers moved in. So if there's some stuff that's blocking the walls, even stack boxes and stuff like that, or it might be a really good idea to put that stuff in a pod uh, prior to the inspection or just move it out of the way or get it in some storage space or something like that. Uh, so finally, some things for sellers to do before the inspection. Uh, some home inspectors might not be able to determine broken thermal seals at times. It might be a good idea just to ask the sellers to clean the windows. Um, I got a really funny animal story. If I finish this in time, I will make sure I tell it. But set up your animals at a pet hotel ahead of time. Uh, change HVAC filters out before the home inspection. Take remotes or ceiling fans for, uh, for ceiling fans or fireplaces out of nightstand drawers. Most home inspectors aren't comfortable rifling through homeowners drawers and dressers and things like that um, so if there are things that are controlled by remote might be a really good idea to just take them out and put them on top of that dresser put them on top of that nightstand for the home inspector as a courtesy uh, get any ashes out of the fireplace um, home inspectors might look in the fireplace i know not every single one looks at a fireplace or tests a fireplace or looks at the chimney but if they can uh, if you're working with a home, one that can they might be a little bit more reticent to do so if there's ashes in the fireplace simply because we do not want to start looking through that fireplace getting ashes on that nice white carpet that tends to like just with the bmw leave uh, get angry calls headed our way from those sellers um, flush well pipes the day before the inspection if you have a well for 15 minutes. Uh, now I want to make sure I'm clear of the language because some people have asked me before, well, what does flush mean? It just means run your well pipes the day before for 15 minutes to get the most, um, you know, so there's no kind of scummy water that's been sitting there for a little while or anything like that or some old water, you know, so if they're taking a water quality sample, then they can get the cleanest sample possible. Make sure all pilots are lit, lights are lit. Make sure all windows are unstuck. That way if an inspector is trying to open that up, he doesn't 
throw his arm out uh, or doesn't break the window rather is what I meant. If he's trying to, you know, put his back into it, put his arm into it, her arm into it, and they try to really get that window unstuck, they can end up breaking a window. We don't want that to happen. And finally, just to avoid any kind of, uh, or help determine electrical issues rather, uh, you know, make, make sure that the light bulbs are changed ahead of time. That way it's not something where it's, there's electrical issues, but really just turns out to be a burnt out light bulb. So just make sure you do that. So guys, that's what I had. I just want to leave this contact information and we will be opening it up to questions, uh, but this is my contact information. And I would tell you to uh, feel free to either call me uh, or email me at these pieces of uh, these, that this email or this phone number. And uh, I'd be more than happy to answer any more questions that you guys might have, um, or if there's something that I might not be answer, be able to answer for you today, um, or there's might be, or there's more more appropriate time to answer it one to one. Um, then at this point, feel free to hit me up on either of these locations, and uh, and our website you can find out more information about us. So that's what I've got. Sarah, do we have any questions? Uh, yes, we have a couple already. Um, just a reminder, everyone, you can type your questions in the bottom of the chat box and I will read them to Matt. Uh, the first question, um, perhaps um, the viewer can elaborate if needed, but they just typed solar with a question mark. Solar. Uh, you know what? That's <laughs> funny. Uh, we, we were just talking about yeah. this before we started our webinar. So when it goes to solar with home inspection, um, Unfortunately, right now, and I know it's becoming a bigger issue, and I would certainly love a situation where we have a training class on, on how to operate solar panels or test solar panels uh, in a safe way. Um, right now, what I know is kind of the standard of, not standard of practice, let me use that, it's not CMR 266, kind of a standard of care in the inspection industry, and this is, in, in my opinion, opinion, it's unfortunate right now is that most home inspectors just claim. This is because none of us are properly trained on how to operate solar panels. Therefore, if we operate them wrong, we can end up breaking the panels, we can end up breaking something, you know, in the roof um, and things like that. So usually we'll have to just claim it in the uh, report. And if the, you know, the panels are covering aspects of the roof, we're going to have to disclaim the roof as well because we can't see what's going on there. But like I said, as soon as a training course opens up, you know, for us as inspectors on how to operate those panels, um, I will, uh, I will certainly, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, you know, most home inspectors are going to flock to that class, and and so because we we do want to be able to knowledgeably um, try to help our clients and help you guys with your clients as much as we can. Um, but I, it's one of those situations where I think we'd be actively risking breaking some equipment or shooting our mouth off about something that we don't know anything about. Okay, thank you, Matt. And next question, what are some of the top questions you would advise clients to ask right before a home inspection? Ooh, that's a really good question. So one thing that, I, first thing right off the bat that I would advise you to do is email me at matt at warrenhomeinspections.com. We have a document that we provide called, and it was something that we used to be required by the state to send to your buyers. And you guys, you know, we sent that as a courtesy to you guys as the agents as well. We still do it now, but nobody's required to do it anymore. But regardless of whether you use us for an inspection or not, I'd be happy to share the document with you. It's called... 10 way, uh, 10 questions to ask for your buyers to ask or 10 questions for buyers to ask a seller or seller's agent prior to the home inspection. Um, that's a really good place to start. Uh, some of the other top questions that uh, I think would be good for buyers to ask. Um, oh, you know what? I'll give a spiel on this. Um, when a buyer is calling us as a home inspector, and I'm, I, Feel free to call me or email me and elaborate if this doesn't answer the question, if this is not what you were thinking, but rather ask them at the inspection or prior to the inspection about how the inspection will go. But I'm going to think that this is more about questions to ask the home inspector about their services and what they provide and how they provide it in order to help them differentiate who they want to trust going forward as far as a selection for a home inspector. Uh, the best 
questions that I can always suggest a buyer ask their home inspector to feel more comfortable with them is how long have you been in business? That's a big one. You know, uh, you know, is this something you're just starting out? Am I test case number 100? You know, every home inspector here in the state needs to get at least 125 inspections under their belt before they can be a licensed inspector. But, you know, you don't want to be 126. Uh, those, those kind of questions are the ones that you want to ask. Um, even if even if being 126 might be perfectly fine, it's still a kind of a, a, a hairy thing or a scary thing to hear. I'm I'm inspection 126, huh? You know, so this is your first one with me as a licensed inspector. Uh, but in the same token, how long have you been in business? Um, if you have your buyer has specific questions in regard to components that they've seen in the home that they might be extra specially curious or even have might maybe have extra special concerns about such as if they're concerned about the electricity if they're concerned about the plumber uh the plumbing the a good question to ask might be hey what was your background before you did this um or if you're going through a multi-inspector firm company what are the background of some of your inspectors before they started getting into this or how long has your how long has your longest tenured inspector been a part of your firm or how long have they been in the inspection industry? Those are the, some questions to ask multi-inspector firms because not every inspection firm you're talking directly to the inspector that's gonna be doing the inspection. Um, so background, uh, how long they've been in business, what some of their specialties might be. Those are really good questions to ask. I would also advise um, even for the buyer that maybe they've got I got uh, you know a guy that I know or somebody suggested me to do. It still might be a really good idea to go to either their you know most are going to have a social media site or a Facebook or a Google. Check their reviews online too. Google, Yelp, Facebook, those are the big three, um, and uh, see what other people have to say about them as well. Uh, those are questions that I would advise in regards to pro when they're selecting a home inspector. Uh, some things, if it, especially if it's a first-time home buyer, that they might be, uh, they could ask prior to the inspection of the inspector is, you know, how long do you think this inspection is going to be? Um, what should I bring? Should I bring any kind of notes? Should I bring any kind of pad? Should I bring any kind of paper? What can I expect the inspection to go like? Uh, is it okay? Yeah, this is a big one. So I'm kind of glad I'm del delving into a little bit more depth on this. This is a big one. Is it okay if I follow you around? Um, so specifically, if you're a first time home buyer, even though this might elongate the inspection, you know, home buyers are going to have questions. And there are certain inspectors out there who their standard of how they do it, their system is to say, we're going to answer all questions at the very end. Just let me do my thing. And, um, you know, I'll meet you back here in about, I don't know, three hours. Uh, you know, but if there's something that they see in that time, you know, as they're going along with the inspector, they can get that question asked right then there and it might alleviate some fear as opposed to waiting on pins and needles until the very end of the inspection to get a report. So uh, the big one, the one that's one of the big ones is can I follow you around and ask questions while I'm, 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 while you're doing the inspection. Uh, Cause not every inspector will say yes. Um, and that might be something to factor into your consideration of, do you want to use this guy or not? Or do they want to use this guy or not? Or this lady, and there's female, uh, there's uh, woman home inspectors as well. Um, I think that covers a lot of the prior questions to ask both to select the home inspector and things to expect up at the home inspection. One thing that I know standard of care is that a lot of home inspectors will also send a confirmation email to buyers regarding here's some things to inspect at the inspection, inspect at the inspection, expect at the inspection. Um, <clears throat> and then of course, like I said, email me, I'll send that 10 question instruction document right over to you. Be more than happy to do that. Okay, looks like that is all the questions this morning. Oh, good. So either I bored everybody to tears or I answered everything in detail. <laughs> yep. So just to remind everybody, this webinar is recorded. It will be live on the website in a few days. And if they have any questions, Matt, they can email you. They can email me or they can even call us, 508-881-1105. I might not pick up the phone directly, but uh, they can definitely get you over in contact with me through that. That's kind of our main hub, if you will, would be that number. Um, and they can definitely get you in contact with me that way. Or if you just want to shoot me an email, matt at warrenhomeinspections.com. Those are the best two ways to get a hold of me. Okay.
Uh, thank you, everyone, and see you next time.